Hello everybody and welcome to episode number 11, the final episode of the Let's Learn Awake guitar series. Today, we will be covering every single note, every single time change, every single chord progression, and a full detailed musical analysis of Space Dive Best by Dream Theater, more like Dreamy Kevin or Kevin Theater because this song was written by the keyboardist. Now you might be asking yourself, Mike, why are we doing a guitar tutorial on a song that barely has any guitar in it whatsoever? Didn't the keyboardist write this as an ode to a girl he fell in love with in a magazine? The answer to the latter is yes. And the former? Well, let's check it out. We got some stuff we got to cover. Now, before we even hit a single note, we have to talk about the uniqueness of this particular track. Sonically, it is completely different from anything Dream Theater has ever done prior and after. The reason being because Kevin Moore wrote this almost solely. All right? The other members of the band really didn't have much to do with this one. And you can tell because all of his various influences, which would use sampling or use different types of palettes that maybe the other band members weren't familiar with at the time, a doubling technique where he himself is singing along with James Labrie, all of these elements come together to create a very dark, melancholic, and just as I said before, unique sound to cap off this album. Now it's also no secret that the lyrics to this song are very strange, very peculiar. Kevin Moore himself has stated that this was a very cathartic thing for him to do, so we're getting into some very odd and dark territory here. The lyrics indicate that Kevin Moore fell in love with a woman in a space dive vest wearing a pair of Doc Martin shoes. The dead giveaway happens right at the beginning. Falling through pages of Martins on angels, feeling my heart pull west. So we can use the heart pulling west as maybe an indication that this is somebody of Germanic descent, perhaps. Maybe blonde hair, blue eyed, we're not entirely sure. I'm just speculating here, but that'll set the tone for the lyrical analysis we do later as well. One of the most important things we have to do before playing a single note on this song is we need to tune our guitar down to drop D tuning. That's D A D G B E. Now let's get into the intro sequence that Kevin Moore plays on the keyboard. It goes like this. The general feeling of this intro is given to us by the melodic sequence that first ascends and then descends back to where we started essentially. So it's like climbing up a mountain just to climb back down again. We've achieved something and now we're back to square one because uh, we got dumped by our girlfriend. Now most of the chords in this progression outline the one chord in different inversions and the five chord in different inversions as well, so we'll get to that. Um, but the first part doesn't start on the one or the five at all, it actually starts on the flat six, which is sparsely utilized throughout the course of this intro. So check out the very first part. We have a B flat Lydian idea that goes like this. So we're utilizing the sharp fourth scale degree, the Lydian mode, with a D, which is the major third, and a B flat, which is the root. And we create that sound. It's a very mystical sound, and it reminds me a lot of Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. If you haven't listened to that album, you should. You'll get a lot of that texture. So moving out of that Lindsey Buckingham inspired thing, we come into the first chord. That's something that you don't see very often. That's starting right off with the James Bond chord. Now the James Bond chord is usually a minor major nine chord, okay? And it sounds a lot like this. But it's not supposed to be played until the end of the entire sequence. When James Bond dies, remember the N64 game Goldeneye? Din -in -din -in. See, that's the James Bond chord. But here, we're opening up with pretty much the exact same thing, minus the minor third. So here's what I'm going to call this. I'm going to call this an A over a D. So it's the five chord over the root note one, which gives us this sound. It's a very open and ominous type of sound, and it just sets the tone for how strange this composition actually is. We come off of that first D into an A7 over C sharp, where the melodic sequence then begins. To an A7 
7 and resolving to an actual D minor chord. So we're coming right off of that C sharp and into an A right to D. All right, so A over D, C sharp, A to D. So the melodic sequence operates on a step up, step down, so we're climbing a mini molehill and then coming back down, going down a third, up a fifth, or in this case a diminished fifth, and stepping down to the next note. So that's the melodic sequence. Step up, step down, third down, fifth up, step down, boom, we do it again, but up a step. So coming out of that first resolution, we're then hitting into a D minor in different inversions. So we're starting here in root position, and then a second inversion D coming to this, which is an A7 on top of a D. So we're back to that five chord over the root note. A lot of tension in this and not animosity, ominosity. That's a good word, but it's really just ominous. Then we come into this chord. Now that sounds like a series of diminished chords, but I think they're still outlining the five chord in different inversions and also altering the chord because we have an E, that would be the fifth of the A, the B flat, that's a flatted ninth, the altered note, G is the flatted seventh, a double G going up to the root, okay? And that's all an altered A7 chord. Then we move down to a C sharp bass note, which is the first inversion, and we, the B flat moves up top here to resolve down to an A of a D minor. So once again, flat nine, flat nine, resolving into that fifth of the D minor. Very cool. Immediately following that, we're inverting the D minor chord into first inversion, going to a D minor seven, to the flat six, but we're anticipating the resolution onto that melodically dissonant part, or harmonically dissonant part, which is the five chord. Now check out those elements. Dun, 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 dun. Now this part can be seen as the minor two chord because it has all of the elements of an E half diminished, um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say that this is still the five chord, and we're just moving the bass line around those notes, creating tension as we move along. E, B flat, G, F, half step back down to E, which creates that melodic half step tension. And then back into a D minor once again. So you see why I'm saying that this is just a one chord going to the five chord almost every single time. Just put some fancier melodic sequences in the bass line. Then we do a descending line down a D minor, but we're changing the bass note. So this is first inversion to an E on the bottom, creating a lot of tension there. When you have an E on the bottom of this line, you have a D and an F on the top, so E would create a flatted seventh and a flatted ninth on top. But since we're moving through it so quickly on a weak beat, it doesn't really matter that much. F, E, D, because we're just coming down to D. We're starting on an F, which is a consonant note, moving to an extremely dissonant one quickly, but stepping right down to D. So our intention is always to get back to D minor. After that D minor, we're hanging on the flat 7 of the A chord, but we're doing this bass line in between. Going from A to B flat, creating a little bit of a uh, flat 6 chord, and then... So let me show you that real quick. We're doing an A sus on top of an A, with the F on the top as well. So that's not something you ordinarily see. And then to a B-flat-6, same melodic function, A7 with a sharp fifth, resolving down to D minor to start the entire progression over again. And then you sneak that B-flat back in there real slickly at the end. The second time around on the introduction, there were only two differences between the first time and the second. The first happens in the middle, um, so let me play it all the way through. We got that lydium going to the black, coming up, right? All the same. Now check it out. On this last part, when 
we hit that D minor 7, anticipating the flat 6, we start this bass line instead of going. We go like this. Start on a G and descend downward until we hit an A, which would be the D minor resolution on the second inversion. So a little bit different that time. The very ending section changes that A to B flat motion that we saw before. Instead of going back and forth so many times, we hold the A on the first one with the flat seven on top. Then we continue the melody like this. That's on the B flat, so the flat six chord, right to a G minor, the minor four. We didn't see that the first time. Which is a B flat Lydian to a G Dorian. And then we finally hit this. That's the A7 with the sharp fifth once again, and then just right into a D minor. Now I do want to stop and just mention this D minor real quick. You're going to see a lot of this throughout this analysis because this is the, uh, the voicing I think is most close to a piano voicing. And I'm basically going open D, A, and then the third fret of the D, which is the minor third, second fret of the G, third fret of the B creates a very nice full D minor sound. The intro ends with a set of chords that utilize a quarter note pulse and they go like this. Now let's talk about these chord voicings a little bit for a second. As I've said previously, Kevin Moore is very slick with how he changes chords. Even for such a simple progression like this, we're only hitting four different chords here. Now it starts on the D minor with this voicing. It's really in first inversion with the F being on the bottom, F-A-D. Now when we switch to the B flat, the D is held out on the bottom, so it's really a B flat over D. And we're only changing one note, which is the A moving up to a B flat, right? So we got three, three, three. And then going to the C, we're changing two notes, the B flat is moving down to a G, and the F is moving down to an E, keeping the D on the top. Now this is a C add 9 chord, believe it or not. That's what's being implied, for sure, because we hit that chord later on in the song, which I will show you, um, but it's still over a D, technically, so a lot of pedal tones. When we change to the F chord, we're taking this pinky note from the D, moving it down to the C, taking this E and turning it to an F, a half step up, but keeping the open G, which creates a little bit of a major second dissonance, okay, which is very quickly resolved with an open D, so you're going F, D, E, C, to cap that off. So we're actually ending on the flatted seventh chord. So ready? One more time. One chord, flat six chord over D, flat seven chord with an added ninth, the relative major, flat seven, and boom, we're into the main motif. Now the main motif brings about a whole nother set of questions. Let me play it for you first, and then you can tell me uh, what you think afterward. Or I'm going to tell you what I think, because you can't really tell me unless, uh, you know, yeah. sounds awfully familiar now does it which one came first the mirror or the space dive vest this is like a chicken and the egg question which one came first Kevin Moore did you want to repeat it on the mirror but earlier on before we got to the main part what is the deal here now I think this came first I think space dive vest is clearly a piano piece that was meant to have this as its main part I don't think the mirror influenced this nearly as much as this influenced the mirror so we got that out of the way but it's the wrong song once again, okay? So Kevin Moore apparently can't play the right song at the right time, um, and that's probably why he didn't go on the Awake tour and abandon the entire thing. But what else do you expect from a guy who uh, fantasizes about Doc Martin's shoes? The arrangement of verse one is an acoustic guitar and a piano with some weird whoosh sounds in the background, all right? But I'm not gonna go over those. Now, Kevin Moore sings under James LeBree's vocal line, which is why it gives it a more haunting effect, a much more haunting effect. James LeBrie, I don't think, is capable of this kind of emotional depth. I'm just going to say it right now. I think Kevin Moore really outlined that throughout these early parts. I know that's a hot take, but I believe it to be true. 
Falling through pages of Martin's on angels, feeling my heart pull west. It also begs the question, are there too many Kevins on this song? Apparently there's too many Kevins in the band because Kevin James Labrie is now James Labrie and Kevin Moore is still Kevin Moore running around with his real name. I think we should just abolish the name Kevin entirely and we won't have this problem. Theoretically all that's happening is we are dealing with D minor and B flat which is the 1 and the flat 6 chord. Now the first one starts on a D minor with a sus 4. Okay, so we have root, fifth, octave, four, which then comes down melodically to three, two, one, five, four, three, which is mi, re, do, but on top of the minor chord. And then a very interesting transition to the flat six chord, where it actually starts on the E of the B flat. Much like the introduction starts like that, but this is hitting E on the downbeat. Usually you don't have the tense note on the downbeat unless you're really trying to create an unbearable environment for everybody else in the band and everybody listening to the music. Check this out. And you try to resolve it immediately after as well, which is a very clever move, but also very sneaky. Sneaky man that Kevin Moore is. Look, the E comes right down to a D before you even have a chance to listen to it. So maybe that's part of the compositional angle here. In between the first couple of verses, we have these very delicate instrumental breaks with basically just piano this time around. Uh, but we're going to play it on the guitar, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be making any noise at all, um, with more quarter note piano chords, just like that transition from the intro to the verse. But here, it has a more defined chord progression. It goes on for much longer. Check it out. We start off on that D minor shape with the FAD on top, riding on an F four times. Very good rhythm. C at nine, resolving to the C, right? So the flat seven coming back up to the one four more times. Repeat that twice. Then melody rises up. B flat major seven. This is the flat six chord. Seven. Flat seven, same thing. Then rise up again. Flat six. Now we come to the G minor to an F with the same melody and a C over E. Now let's just talk about that melodic line that happens. On that second E, we go like this. That comes up to the melody note A which is on top of a B flat, okay? So the fifth note of the D minor scale becomes the major seventh of the B flat. So we're creating a B flat major seven, a very nice peak, a wonderful way to come down with the bass line and go up with the melody. And then it's so good that we have to do it twice, right? Once more. Okay, then we ride on the B flat, we hit the four chord. Now this is interesting, on the F, we play the same exact melodic line, just like I mentioned before, but we stop it at the G and we don't go up to the A. So we're actually stopping just before we hit that peak. Could be symbolic of Kevin Moore's relationship of the time. Failed. This section of the song also includes a sample from A Room With A View. Not that crappy talk show with Joy Blowhard and Whoopsie Goldberg. We don't want to watch that. This is a romantic drama from 1985, almost two hours in length and Kevin Moore watched the whole thing. Unbelievable. Now it's really odd and almost contradictory that Kevin Moore would include a quote that uh, talks of a man who seemingly objectifies women. Can't have any real love connection with somebody because he just sees them as objects of desire or blah 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 blah. Now the reason being that he is literally infatuated with a girl in a magazine ad. That's like the literal 
definition of object, right? You're looking at the magazine ad, you're like, oh man, look at those boots and that hot girl and the thing, right? And he also admits in the lyrics that if she came off the page, it wouldn't work out. The irony here is astonishing, no pun intended, baffling, and I absolutely love it. Thank you, Kevin Moore, for writing such a brilliant paradox. Right after the peak of that melodic line, we come into verse number two, which has a couple different variations, one of which being an itty-bitty change that'll make you want to rip your hair out because it's so subtle, and one's a big, massive change that'll also want to make you rip your hair out because it's so massive. Let's talk about the massive change first. That is the distorted electric guitar that has more gain on it than I think I've ever heard in my life especially in a Dream Theater song. And it just goes like this, we're in drop D, we have to remember that, and we're doing this. Just power chords open to a B flat that looks like that. And we have to finger it like that, otherwise it's not gonna sound right. We need the fifth down at the bottom for that B flat chord. Going back and forth. Now, the itty bitty change comes the third time around through the progression. And instead of just going D minor to B flat like we ordinarily do, we hit a G at the end. Check this out. D, three, four, going to B flat with the F on the bottom, G right there. And then it goes right back to normal the fourth time around. So that's why I'm saying this makes you want to rip your hair out. Such a subtle thing, and you can't even really tell it's happening until it happens, until you know that it's there. You don't know that it's there. Unbelievable. Let's hear the electric guitar part and the piano part played together. Now the second break is exactly the same as the first break. The piano is doing the same chord structure, okay? But we also have two massive changes here. So instead of an itty bitty and a massive change, we have two massive changes. The first of which being the distorted electric guitar continuing to play and bludgeon the entire section. We start with a D, coming down to a C, Changing with the piano, still have that low fifth in the bass, by the way. So we have to play the power chords in that weird shape. Then C again. Then we go right down, B flat. Same melodic line and everything. Up to C. Then we come down to B flat. Two, three, four, G. And then F, E just like in the piano part. The next big change of this section is within the samples that are being used. Now instead of just one sample, as in the first part, we have multiple samples that break up this whole section. Uh, the first of which is just from some uh, Canadian drama series. I don't know what's up with Kevin Moore in these drama series and romantic movies and stuff. Very odd that he'd be into that kind of thing, but uh, it's a Canadian drama series, so we know that Kevin James Labrie is Canadian, so blah 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 blah. It's all the analysis we need there. But the second quote is a crazy juxtaposition of what might be happening here. And I think it has to do with Kevin Moore's weird fetish. The second sample of this part that's being used is news coverage of the O.J. Simpson trial, or the O.J. Simpson case in general. Now, I'm not sure if they're talking about that infamous car chase where the cops were chasing after him in his uh, white Ford Bronco, an iconic historical event, no doubt. Um, or if it was just the general surroundings of the whole situation, I'm not entirely sure, but this is an indicator of the type of media that Kevin Moore was consuming during this time. 
But is Kevin Moore revealing a little bit more than uh, I think he wants us to know? Within only two verses, Kevin Moore's lyrical focus has shifted quite dramatically, from his heart being pulled western by an ostensibly Germanic-looking woman wearing Doc Martens, to now a fugitive O.J. Simpson wearing a white Ford Bronco. Stay woke, Kevin Moore. Stay woke. All joking aside, it's very interesting that he would include the O.J. Simpson news coverage as part of this whole thing, right? He's trying to paint this picture of a horrible breakup. And, um, oh geez, this is getting, this is getting way too dark. We're going to stop going in this direction now. Um, the third sample, however, comes from the Conan O'Brien show, but it's another juxtaposition because it sounds like Conan is some kind of like, uh, I don't know, a motivator. Somebody who's trying to motivate an astronaut going into outer space and saying like, hey man, you can survive these horrendous conditions in space. He's like, it's 180 degrees, but it's a dry heat. Blah, blah, blah in a swimming pool. It just sounds like something that somebody going into outer space would have to undergo. I think that's very interesting as well. So it appears as if Kevin Moore has some weird object fetish with Doc Martens, Ford Broncos, and Conan O'Brien's head. But let's move on and see if we can find out a little bit more about this track. Right after that, we come into a very quiet and delicate section with Kevin Moore just playing on the keyboard with some very quiet samples in the background. Now here's the whole part together and I'll outline the chords as we go along. start off on a D minor, nice four to five, coming down, C, resolving up to the fifth, back to the one chord, D minor, nice and quiet too. This time, resolving to the major third. This time, that G to A becomes the major seventh of the B flats. We're on the flat six chord again. Come up to the ninth for this beautiful melodic line to the C chord again back up C again then this little thing this is a very interesting usage of a C chord here. We're actually playing right along with a true Mixolydian mode here because we're coming down the flat 7 to 6 to 5 and then flat 7, 6 to 5 up the octave. So very rudimentary stuff. And then a sus4 coming out of it. So. Now this is the epitome of a strong melody line. If we take a look at this, we have a bunch of repeating things that happen every single time with little changes in between. The first of which is this. That's the G going up to the A, which happens on top of both of the D minor and the B flat major chord, giving them a sense of unity and cohesion. Coming down. And then we always do some kind of resolution on the C, but that's what changes, okay? So the first part pretty much remains the same. The second part changes a little bit. And then we always scale back up using this D minor scale starting on C. And then repeating the process all over again. The last time around, or the second to last time, we go... We come up to the higher notes. So once again, adding variations to something that's very familiar to us. Great job. Now with this last part, we're coming back into the verse, but we're not necessarily playing it in the same way at all. That riff that we were using before from the mirror went away completely, and uh, now I'm going to show you a little more of an esoteric thing. This is not really easy to hear, but check it out. This is the piano part that's going on underneath the heavy electric guitars. And that 
continues to repeat a couple more times. Now all we're doing is starting the D chord with a melodic line on A, like this. Coming down to the root note with that syncopation. When we hit the B flat chord, we have the sixth on top. So it's a B flat six to the five, to the sharp four, and then to a G chord, root, flat seven, six, fifth, to the fourth, but that acts as the flat seven coming back into the root note. A C D Now overall that we just have the electric guitar playing the same old power chord voicings, but just moving along with those chords. So nothing crazy going on there. Let's hear what that sounds like. After that verse section, we come back into that mirror motif, or really it's the space divest motif, and we're playing it now on electric guitar with some chords running behind it. Let's go over the chords first. We have the D minor to B flat, G minor, so it's just the one flat six, right? Check it out, here we go. with this melody line on top. Now a couple things of note here, you must play it with just your middle finger on the fretboard as John Petrucci did in that one documentary video. And you have to play it while someone's spraying fast fret on your fingers and also with an ebo. Now an ebo is just a, a little magnetic device that vibrates on the string to keep it vibrating so you don't have to pick at all so it gets rid of any of that pick attack. Or you can do what I'm doing and use the Fernandez sustainer system, which works as a great substitute if you don't feel like getting a separate device. So after we play that more grandiose version of the main theme, we come back into the final verse section, where we really get the idea that Kevin Moore will never be open again. The chords go like this underneath. We start off with a one chord in the D minor, to a one chord in first inversion, and then the flat six chord, major seven, we've seen that chord plenty of times already before, and then the G minor, the four chord, and that keeps on cycling around and around and around until all these verse lines are completed. This last synth line has the same verse progression that we just heard with the D minor, major 7 to G minor. It goes around to repeat twice and then we hit B flat for the flat 6 for two measures and G minor, right, just riding on it. We go back again, B flat, right, very dramatic, and then G minor, and then this final chord progression, right? We start with a D minor with this line on top, which is 1, 2, 3, 1, 5, going to an E chord with a B flat on top, coming down to an A. So this could either be a C chord in first inversion or a C7 in first inversion, or it could be an E diminished. Just a lot of tension created with a chord like this. And then on an F, you have a G on the top as the melody note, so you're already starting with a ninth, coming down to the one, and then once it hits the E in the melody, the bass note goes to an A, so the chord shifts entirely. So it's D minor to perhaps C, and then F with a ninth, and then right into an A, sus two, to end off the loud section, which then comes right back into the introduction just the piano, nice and tender one time through, 
to end swiftly on a D minor. That wasn't swift at all, it was actually very beautiful. So what a lovely composition by Mr. Kevin Moore. Kevin Dreamy, Dreamy Kevin, Kev the Dream Theater, James Labrie, not James Labrie, Dream Theater guy. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about anymore because there have been so many notes, there have been so many time changes, and there have been so many chord progressions on this Awake album that I can't even think straight anymore. But I thank you for coming along on this journey because it's been a long one. And I know anybody who's been there since the beginning understands that and uh, can cut me a little slack for not having much uh, productive stuff to say at the current moments. Now, uh, if you want to further support the channel, go to www.subscribestar.com slash Romanova Music, and you can become a monthly patron. You can give me any amount of money per month that you wish, anywhere from one to a hundred, whatever. I prefer a hundred dollars a month. That would be nice. And uh, you could also go to my PayPal tip jar and give me a tip. You know, these videos take a very, very, very long time, very labor intensive, and uh, in this particular case, I had to completely retool the arrangement. Which, by the way, if you're still paying attention here, the next video I put out is going to be a full-fledged guitar arrangement of Space Dive Vest, and I might even be doing a little bit of singing on it. Actually, I've been doing a lot of singing on it. So, with all, uh, with all that said, thank you very much, and I'll let you know what the next one is going to be, the next series that I come out with, but uh, there might be something different on the horizon. So stick around.